Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. Today, I have with me the wonderful Sangeeta Pillai. Sangeeta is not just a really, really close personal friend, but she's also the creator of the award-winning Masala Podcast. So if you haven't heard Masala Podcast, you really need to go out there and listen to it. It's absolutely amazing. She's also the creator of an umbrella brand called Soul Sutras, which tackles taboos in South Asian culture. And I think Sankita does one of the most amazing jobs out there in the cyberspace, the space of bringing information to people. And I'm absolutely delighted, Sangeeta, to have you with us today. Seema, it's such a pleasure, such a pleasure to know you. Uh, you and I have become friends over the kind of last year. Seema was on Masala Podcast. You must go and listen to her amazing episode where she talked about the Kama Sutra. She's the expert. Uh, and it's such a joy to be here, Seema, chatting with you this sunny afternoon. The sunny afternoon in London, we're not having many of those, so this yeah. is really a bonus for us. So today, Sangeeta, I want to actually address a point which has really been bothering me. Um, I want to talk to you about BDSM today. And the reason I want to bring up BDSM is because it's it's like the, the buzzword, isn't it? The, the porn is throwing this up and everybody thinks that they want to be in BDSM. And I find the problem is that a lot of content creators, sex educators, lots of people are talking about it. None of them have actually ever experienced it or know what it's about. And they're talking about it from this point of ignorance, which I think is actually creating a lot more problems. And they keep banding this word consent around. So I thought today, um, and for everybody out there who's listening, I personally, I, I haven't ever been with a partner who's into BDSM, but I've attended about three workshops to actually understand what you go through, fairly intense workshops. And Sangeeta also has attended a couple of workshops, plus she was writing a book where um, there was a lot of content around BDSM. And I know that Sangeeta, you did a lot of research with people who are actually in the scene. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'd be delighted to talk about my very limited experience of it. So before we set off, I must say I am not an expert. I'm not in the scene. It's not something I practice in my own personal life. But I know and I've had conversations with people who do. So just to kind of put it out there. So um, I remember seeing a, a clip of your workshop where you went. And I think you went for a spanking workshop. And I just want to say uh, there that generally... In the, um, in the BDSM movement, or, I mean, at least in the workshops that I attended, I was told that that is the space that you normally start with. You start with spanking. And you thought it was really funny, didn't you? You, you giggled a lot. I, I thought it was hilarious. So, the <laughs> so it was where I did this was with some friends in a club. So uh, one of the people who's uh, now transitioned, she's a woman now. Uh, was really into spanking and she said shall I try this on you and she had this kind of uh, whip or ladle or whatever the technical term is and it just made me laugh because it was just so funny um, it was a really interesting sensation and it's the first time I've experienced anything like it so to tell you about it what uh, the person did first of all and this is key I think is like are you okay if I do this and she did that each time she did that she just didn't go like find my behind and just kind of go for it. That's not what she did. Each time she said, are you ready? Are you okay? And she would spank me. And also what she was doing, which I thought was really lovely. There was, she would st stroke my behind a little bit. So she almost kind of warm up the area and then spank me each time she did that. So there was something quite, it's so weird that something that is seen as aggressive actually is quite caring. And I think that's the whole point of BDSM, from what I understand, that you are so caring of somebody that if they would like pain as their pleasure, that's what you're doing. But you're doing it in a really caring way. Yeah, uh, I think that is so key. I'm so glad that you said that because I just think that in most people's head, BDSM is like about just getting really rough out there. And 
like you, the first time I attended a BDSM workshop, I didn't know anybody over there. I arrived over there. I was like, I need to understand this. I need to do this. You can imagine. Okay, so this was mostly women. I think there were two men who were in the workshop who were partners of the women who'd come along. Everybody else out there, it was just female. But I didn't know anybody. And suddenly you're told that you're going to be spanked. And then you're told, so, you know, I'm already on edge because I'm thinking, um, do I really want to go through this? This is going to involve pain. And like you said, they have, you can either use a whip or they have something that looks almost like a, a TT racket, like yes. a table tennis racket, yes. but it's like a flexible spatula made of rubber, which they use for spanking. And you know what was very weird? So we were told the first thing you do, and I want everybody out there listening to please pay attention to this because we throw that word consent and trust and love around, but nobody knows what they're actually saying. So the first thing they did was they said, they partner you up. Did you have a friend that you were with that you were partnered yes, with? Yes, yes. Okay, so you were lucky. You had a friend that you were with. I had a complete stranger and we were told, you now have to hug each other. You have to put your arm around the other person and make them feel really safe and secure within your arms and that was a really bizarre kind of situation because I don't know this person she's a complete stranger we walked into a workshop and we're being told that this is what you have to do but like you just said it's it's actually so caring this idea that you start off by saying I care I'm not going to hurt you you are going to be in my arms look I'm holding you yes, yes. and it was incredible because by the end of the workshop, I have to say, we were friends, you know, um, it, it, you share something really deep. Yeah. And then, like you said, each time in our case, each time, so she, she would be like, okay, I'm going to do it now. So she warned you. She then spanked and the degree would go up gradually. That's exactly what I experienced and, as well. And each time they spanked, you stop. And then you rub that area to make it better. So she would either rub it or you kiss it better. That is exactly and, it. And, you know, I, and I think it's so important that we actually say this to people because every single time I have heard someone speak about it, they, they, they kind of talk about it as, oh, but there are rules around BDSM and consent is really important. Consent is not that at the start of it, you say, okay, we're going to do this. Yeah, yeah, fine. If you want to do it, I'll do it. And that's taken as consent. It's with every movement. Exactly, exactly. And it's every movement and every moment you watch for the other person's reaction. You make sure that they are feeling cared for, that they are being asked what they want, how much they want of it. And that's what really kind of impressed me about my kind of one session that I did with this spanking exercise. Um, not only was I asked each time, okay, are you ready? The area was kind of gently touched. Then I was spanked. And then there was the aftercare. And th then it was rubbed again. And you just felt like, oh, this is kind of really nice. It's just so bizarre that it's, spanking and it was painful and also the, she would ask me each do you want me to up it so she would do a little bit first and then slowly up it so nothing was like whack just like that that you weren't expecting and I think that is a microcosm of everything that people talk about in the BDSM space I think that's the thing if if anybody that's watching or listening to this takes this one thing away that every moment and every movement is about caring for the other person whereas conversely what we think of as bdsm is inflicting pain on another person you're doing as much as they want as much as they can take and as much as is welcome and that's it I think. and the person receiving it has to be equally into it so it's, it can't just be that the person who's giving it is like i really love inflicting pain hence yeah. i'm going to go into yeah. bds that yeah. is not bdsm it's the person who's actually getting it. Yeah. This is their fantasy. This yeah. is for yeah. them. For them. But, um, you know, you said that you actually spoke to, we'll come back a little bit more to our yeah. personal experiences and I'm going to tell you what else we went through because 
I went through three workshops. So we went all the way from spanking um, to tying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was that whole thing of what kind of knots you use. Then this idea of the safe word, then this idea of, you know, where you sort of massage the person on the heart to calm them down because the, as you go higher in your passion, yeah. your yeah. pain threshold increases, but so does the desire to, um, to do it, you know, to get more yeah. rough with it, let's say, you know, whatever the word is. And funnily enough, the Kama Sutra also talks about it. So we'll come to that in a minute. But you were saying that you interviewed these people and spent time talking to a couple who yeah. were very into the scene. So will you tell yeah. us a little bit more about them? So it was such a fascinating conversation for me. So I was writing this book in which BDSM was an element of it. And I asked a couple of friends who I knew were in the scene. Uh, and one of them agreed to speak to me. And she was very close to a friend of mine. So she spoke very openly. So they were a married couple. Um, and she was, I think she was the dominant one and he was the submissive. So they're the, dub, the dom and the sub. And the way that she explained it to me, she's like, it was all about caring and nurturing, right? And he... Uh, needed her to sometimes tell him quite strongly whether he'd done his work he was doing his phd or something like that and that was also part of their nurturing and caring for each other um, and then he would ask for specific um, levels of pain he would ask her to do that and then she would give him whatever he needed sometimes it would be that she would deny him the pain because that was part of their kind of play as well um, and a lot of things were, it was, it was what they called, I think 24 seven, that's what they did. So either you had a 24 seven role play that that's your life, or you chose certain parts of your life when you had that. Um, and I think they were 24 seven. So they're pretty much their entire life was this, uh, this kind of playing of roles. And she would always tell me from what I remember, this was years ago that a lot of it was about she would shout at him because she want, he wanted her to shout at him. And that was kind of their thing. Have you done this or have you not done that kind of thing? And then the reward would also be um, different levels of pain. And she, showed, she told me, but I don't remember the, the various implements, but there was something like a hairbrush. There was something else like a whip. There was something else like with serrated edges and things like that. Uh, so depending on what he wanted at that particular point. And what I went away with that was like an impression of a really loving relationship, actually. There was so much intimacy and so much caring for each other within that roles that they created for themselves. Um, I found it really sweet, actually, and really romantic. It just sounds a bit crazy when you say it, but it was really sweet and it was really romantic because they were so into each other. And so loving of each other in exactly the way that the other wanted. But isn't that the whole point? Like I know that yeah. the Kama Sutra says that um, the secret to being a good lover, so not a desirable lover, we have to make this distinction each time, that yeah. a desirable lover is just uh, somebody who is really sexy and exciting and somebody that you want yeah. to be with. Yeah. A good lover is somebody who's good with you when you're being intimate yeah. together. Yeah. Yeah. And the secret of being a good lover is being able to do what the other person wants, to focus entirely on the other person's pleasure, not think about yourself, so to drop your own ego. It's not about what you can do, but what yeah. the other person wants you to do. Exactly. And um, I love this idea. I'm going to go back to this point of the 24-7. Now, this is something I did not know about, that you can mm. actually have two sets of, um, um, I, I don't know, relationships where... Some BDS, BDSM couples are in this role play 24-7, so that's their entire life. And others have specific times that they set aside. So they kind of have what is the outside BDSM life that other people would consider normal. And then they have these moments of passion where yeah. they indulge in this. Yeah. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. And there were so many things, and I'm sure I've got a notebook somewhere, and I wish I dug it out before our chat. Uh, when I was researching the book and to me it sounded like they they created this kind of universe in their 24-7 space of how they were together with each other and when they went that 
left when they left that universe they were kind of normal people doing normal things and going to the supermarket or whatever but when they came home they were 24 7 uh and everything and from what i remember her telling me everything was as per the rules of their universe so i don't know if you wanted a cup of tea you would shout at the person to give you a cup of tea because that was the rule mm-hmm. Um, if you wanted sex, you'd demand sex because that was your role. So do you see how I mean? Like, so that's their 24-7 universe where everything played into that dom and sub role. Wow. So to me, it was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I yeah, don't know if I mean, they maintained that forever. Like, I don't know if they did that uh, six months, we do that. And then I don't really know about that. But at that point, when I met them, when I met her, this is what they were doing. That's amazing. Like I said, I didn't know about this bit of it. So um, one of the things that we used, uh, which we tried, was tying. You know, mm-hmm. um, so first you have to understand knotting, which kind of knots you use, how you use these knots, because everybody has a different level of um, tying that they can take. And I remember when I was the the sub, when I was being tied, it was so it freaked me out so mm-hmm. much this Mm -hmm. idea that I was going to, even though it was in a workshop with a lot of other people, with a teacher in charge, Mm -hmm. in a place where, you know, there was nothing likely to happen to you. But even then, the fear of being tied to having your hands tied was really, I mean, like, there's just some intrinsic part of you that my my breathing went up, my heart rate shot up. Mm -hmm. It was a really uncomfortable feeling. And then they show you how the initial set of knots that you do you can actually untie them as well. So it's not just that you will be tied Mm. up and the other person will have to let you out. But yeah, they they do knots where you would be tied up and you could let yourself out. And of course, the other extreme is the Japanese system of knotting where um, those knots are far more intense. They become almost like an art form because that's a huge skill that you have to learn. Yeah. And they would knot you and not just tie you to the bed, but suspend you from the ceiling and so Mm. on with those knots. Mm. So it's a whole range of things. Mm. But, you know, for everyone out there, like I said, everybody wanting to understand that they want to try BDSM and, oh, yeah, this is really exciting because this is what we see in pornography. You know, somebody gets out there and starts going, wallop, 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 you know, Mm. tying somebody else up Mm. and then much thrashing around. That's not how it happens so uh, you you take the the string the rope whatever you're going to use you tie it together and actually the sub is sometimes the one who will put the knots into it just to feel safe initially did your couple ever talk to you about knotting no they didn't actually um what i'm trying to remember was some of the things other things that she said to me and it came back to me she said um 50 shades of gray has so much to answer for (sighs) she was so against it because it's like it kind of subverts the whole idea of this which is consent 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 she's like you don't even go into a room where there's say there's a bdsm session going on among couples you don't even go in there unless there's consent there's consent at every point before you do every single thing over and over and over again. It's that important. Whereas what we saw in Fifty Shades was like there's some silly contract that she signs and then she doesn't even know what she's doing. And, you know, it's just um, she really, really was very anti this whole film and kind of how it depicted BDSM. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was that um, with bringing it back to kind of our culture, South Asian culture that we're part of. Already we have problematic um, relationship patterns from between men and women. Men are kind of seen as the, 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 the chaser, even in Bollywood, he's saying, she's saying no, 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 but actually she means yes, 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 which is bullshit. When she's saying no, it means no. But we've been brought up on this diet of women say no, but it doesn't really mean anything. So when you add BDSM to that as another layer, it becomes hugely problematic because BDSM is not, like you said, Seema, and I've said, about ignoring what somebody's saying and whacking the hell out of them or thrashing them or whipping them. It is not about that. 
It is about catering to their desire. If their desire is to be dominated, you do that. But you do that with care, like we've said. You do that gently. You do that by paying attention to them. And that is so true when we look at it from our cultural context. It is never about approaching, if you're a man, approaching a woman, and if she's saying no, thinking that, oh, she just, you know, is just saying stuff. It is not if you're in a sexual relationship with somebody, um, I don't know, pulling out some whatever, whips and chains and handcuffs or whatever, and going for it without really seeing what, what it is they want. So I think we have to be, as South Asians, particularly sensitive to how we play this out. Oh, God, yeah. You know, um, at somewhere near the middle of last year, so while we were in the um, the depths of lockdown, I had this email from a young girl. So a lot of young women had written in saying, my partner mm -hmm. wants BDS and my partner enjoys um, inflicting pain, you know, et cetera. But this one particular email had really made me sit up and think because she said, uh, she it, she was a virgin. Um, it was locked down, so she hadn't managed to meet this guy. They were getting married, so the mm -hmm. wedding had all been set up, then postponed slightly because lockdown started, and mm -hmm. the whole world was sort of stuck in this this time warp. And she said that they were ending up having a lot of conversations on the phone, mm -hmm. and this guy was really into pain. Mm -hmm. She said that she was petrified. One is, she, I mean, she came from a very conservative small town family where mm. she had never even masturbated. She was, mm. an, she was a virgin. She'd never even masturbated. He's over there telling her that he wants to watch her getting injections in her butt. He wants to watch her being, uh, like he wanted to watch the beating so that, you know. And she said there's all sorts of things and he keeps everything that he, that turned him on somehow included her receiving pain oh. in some way and you can imagine I, I mean he even went as far as to say one of his fetishes was to watch her uh, wee on the floor or poop on the floor and then playing with her mm. with her feces now all this may be in somebody's head and they might want to do it you can imagine the you can imagine the fear in this girl's mind cool. she said I can't talk to my family about it like, you can imagine if they're that conservative yeah. She definitely cannot go and tell her mother about it. How do you go and tell anybody else about it? Most of your friends haven't been through this. What do you say? How do you approach someone? And it was just, and I can almost imagine the fear. Like I said, I attended a workshop voluntarily, knowing mm. that there would be very limited things. I was petrified. Mm. Even when it started and, the, you know, we were told, no, you have to hug the other person. You have to make mm -hmm. sure that, mm -hmm. you know, when their heart rate goes up, you actually mm -hmm. massage them mm -hmm. even on the heart. You make sure that they calm down. Mm -hmm. Even with that, um, Sangeeta, I was petrified. Yeah. Can you imagine what this girl must have been feeling like? My God, poor thing. I, that just sort of breaks my heart that somebody is in that situation and hasn't gotten out like cannot talk to anybody and is going to be married to this guy yeah. who doesn't seem to understand the basic fundamentals of what he's doing. Like that would work if the, the other party was into it as well. She clearly wasn't. She wasn't so, and she was petrified and she didn't yes. even know what it was about. Yeah, I mean, that is so heartbreaking. My God, poor thing. And I'll tell you something, even if, you know, um, even if you get to that point of passion where you, so the Kama Sutra, of course, talks about, um, you know, using a certain amount of force, like there's love scratches, love bites, yeah. etc. We'll talk about that in a minute. But even when you get to a point where your passion is that increased, I still don't want injections being put into me and my body. I don't want to feel the pain of a needle yeah. for somebody else's pleasure. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because it, it seems to miss the whole point that pleasure is a, is a dual thing. It's for both of you. The act of pleasure, sexual pleasure, is for two people. It is not just one person getting whatever they need and the other person feeling pain or feeling worthless or whatever. Unless that's what they want. You know, like, but it seems to miss the whole point of this. Yes. And I think from what you just said, I guess the next point to make for everybody out there is 
that you have to go really slow. You have to approach it ever so slowly. Because if you go in there, so the Kama Sutra, of course, as I said, talks about um, certain things. It talks about certain types of hits. So it's a treatise, it categorizes everything. So it says you can either hit at such and such point of passion with this many fingers from the front or with this part of the hand, or, you know, so it gives you four different types of um, hand mudras that you can use mm. for hitting purposes. But I guess it's giving you that much detail, you know, like literally pointing mm. out the, mm. the specifics, mm. because when you're writing it down in a book, how do you make people understand mm. exactly yeah. what to do? So they're giving yeah. instructions. But it says, you know, that love biting, for instance, mm. Um, mm. if if he bites you too hard, it actually says to women, mm. if he bites you too hard, tell him to stop. Mm. If he doesn't stop, tell him twice. And if he doesn't stop, then you push him down, sit on top of him, back, bite him back twice as hard till he does stop. Mm. Mm. So it's like, it's yeah. about your consent saying, you know, like yeah. you are in charge. Don't let anybody else put this on you. But it says also very specifically that you don't start your foreplay with love bites and with thrashing mm. out. You have to warm up that you area you have to rouse the passion yeah and incidentally it also says that only a donkey would start with bite love bites because apparently when donkeys <laughs> have sex they start with biting each other on the neck so <laughs> that's brilliant so do you want to be a donkey or do you want to be a human being what is it do you, yeah. do you want to be like a fabulous lover or do you want to be a donkey but uh, yeah so um I just think that it's the, this, um, like I said, I've heard in recent times, various, various people sort of jump into conversations mm. or to come into conversations with this idea of BDSM and talk about how, oh yeah, yeah, you know, this can go. If you're into BDSM, then this is fine too. It isn't. You are not okay to say that mm. this is fine or this isn't. Only the two people involved can decide if yeah. this is in their contract of BDSM or not. Yes. And I want specifically educators and creators, content creators to please stop saying this because you really are fostering the wrong impression. Absolutely. Also, don't forget that if you, if this is the message you give out and somebody goes and does something to someone else, you are traumatizing people for life you know, intense physical trauma sits within your body and you stay with it for the rest of your life. Like that young girl, I mean, if she got married to that guy, I mean, you know, these are physiological responses that are built in our body. Seema, you were talking about how your heart started racing and whatever. I've, you know, experienced a little bit of something similar. Our bodies are designed to detect threat and elevate. Why does the adrenaline go up at the heart rate? So you can run. It's a deeply wired physiological response from an evolutionary point of view. So if something really uh, traumatic happens and somebody isn't able to say, that stays with them. So you're scarring someone for life, basically. So remember that. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, the, the reason that we've had to address this today is, as I said, because it's been flagged up, like you said, 50 shades of gray went viral. I mean, every human being on the planet was trying to be 50 shades of gray at some point. And it's great when you're imagining it in your head, even as the recipient yeah. of it, it yeah. probably gets very exciting when it's just in the head. Reality is very different when we yeah. fantasize. It's a whole different ballgame. And I know that with this young girl, she said to me, she said, every time I say to him that this makes me very uncomfortable, he would, she said, he laughs and says, you'll be fine. Don't worry. You'll be fine. And I just want to say that that does not put any fears to rest. I don't want to hear the other person say, don't worry. You'll be fine. I want them to say, I won't do it if you don't like it. Exactly. Exactly. It is a mutual pleasure situation. That's what it's supposed to be, right? Uh, mutual excitement, mutual pleasure, whatever that looks like. But it has to be for the two of you, like Seema, what you were saying. What is it? The contract is with the two of you. It cannot be one person enforcing whatever works for them on the other person. 
whether that's you know overt or subconscious that is not okay so tell me what made you go and try the spanking workshop what drew you to it oh it was just uh, we were at a club and there was my my friend who said you know would you like to try this and i'm like yeah sure so i'm quite curious about things i guess i'm curious about life and sex and everything um and i just wanted to see what it felt like like in a in, in a physical way what did it feel like and to me it just kind of tickled me like not so much in a physical way i just thought it was really funny um uh, something about it made me really giggly and playful i guess it just kind of felt like children running around spanking each other you know so it brought out that my kind of child self almost it wasn't sexual at all for me um the other two times now that we're talking that i've tried maybe things one was uh that somebody there was a partner i had at the time who used hot wax on me okay uh and now there's a special kind of wax which i, I it's not the same candle wax because that burns i think because there's special kind of wax and again from what i remember him doing he was very gentle he stroked the area a lot he asked me if i was ready then poured and it was very pleasurable he poured it all over my back um and it was in so it to me it felt like everything was heightened like i could really feel everything i could feel his breath i could hear every sound so all my senses were very very heightened from what i remember so the pleasure was heightened as well and i think that was the purpose of of the wax um and i think he also tried like something that felt like sort of felt like a cheese grater there was like a little device i don't know what it's called but you again you run it on the on the skin so it doesn't pierce the skin but it's really rough and again what it does is you feel everything 10 times over so whatever sensation is like whoa that's really really magnified so then if he's kissing you you really feel it i think that's the point of this from what the little bit that i understood um so that's been my kind of experiences of it i did i i also like you was tied up i think it wasn't a workshop it was an actual uh, a partner and i couldn't really cope with it i just didn't like it uh it made me um i think he just tied my hands or he blindfolded me i think that's what he did and i just i found it very uncomfortable so i asked him to take it off so i it's not something that i would do but i think it has to be something that feels right for you for each one of us i think what 50 shades of gray and mainstream media have made it like everybody wants to be whipped and spanked and blindfolded and hurt that is not the case <laughs> no absolutely um so the the wax thing now i've never yeah. tried the wax thing but that really interests me so what i want to know is now i'm always saying that if you want um You, you know if you want to create a pleasure zone on your body like any part of your body can be an erogenous zone all you have to do is you have to treat it right so basically um i always say that if you want that to be a pleasure zone you you have to touch it with like the barest touch so like you were talking about the cheese grater you know like you you graze it with the tip of your nail just so that it really sort of sensitizes you know it makes mm. it's such a light touch that mm. it makes every nerve ending mm. kind of crave and say yeah. um what's happening over here everything yeah, comes yeah. alive we're really aware of what's happening in this yeah. particular area and yeah. it it and then if you kiss somebody over there it's like <gasps> oh, it yeah. just explodes it's amazing yeah. so for everyone out there don't get yourself a cheese grater or an implement or or try a candle it. wax it's a special <laughs> type of candle yeah. wax so please try don't it. take the candle and pour it on your partner's body you're going to burn no, them please don't, don't oh do my it. god no uh but try it with like i said just you know use the tip of your nail to graze it touch it very very lightly the lighter the touch the more sensitive that area becomes and then the pleasure that the your partner is going to get is it's totally intense but coming back to the wax what fascinated me was so when he sensitized that area for you when he touched it because the back is already so mm. um mm. It, it's got so much yeah. sensation doesn't it yeah it really does i mean just also, being kissed on the back yeah. even otherwise is like <gasps> it pops and Sorry. he also turned me around so i couldn't see what was going on so uh, you know i was facing the wall and he was behind me he did talk me through it so i'm now going to do this are you okay with this 
how does this and he would drip the slightest bit of candle wax say how does that feel and then i'd be say i'd be say oh yeah that's okay then he'd do a bit more and he'd do so i'm now going further down your back so there was no sudden anything but the area was highly 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 sensitized because there's hot wax you know so everything kind of comes alive mm -hmm. um and that's what I remember. I remember feeling it was very exciting. I was very turned on. I thought it was a fantastic sensation. But, so the, the, I was actually asking about the touch. Now, at this point, okay. was the touch, the very light touch to sensitize it? Or was it like a harder rubbing to make it a little less sensitive so that the wax wouldn't hurt because there are different types of touch? Yeah. So I think from what I remember, it was... A, a kind of nurturing touch like it was quite a caring touch to say I'm okay. here okay. and I'm stroking your back and it was very warm from what I remember it wasn't a light touch it was like it's all okay I'm preparing you for this okay. that's the kind of touch it was okay because one of the workshops that we attended like I said you know it was about sort of then accepting a certain amount of um either um, hitting or, you know, mm. the, the twang of the whip or mm, whatever. Mm, mm. And for that one, what they would do is they would actually rub that area harder, you know, like yes. this. So you really, yeah. yes. so it sort of um, heats up the area, but also yeah. makes it already used to um, a certain amount of roughness. Of, yeah. 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 So yeah. it actually increases the ability to take some. So, it, mm. you know, whereas the lighter touch makes it very, very sensitive. Yes. So it heightens it. So like, yeah, it's brilliant if you're going to kiss somebody there or whatever. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah, if you're going to start spanking someone, the idea is to actually warm it up a little bit harder, warm yeah, it up a little yeah, bit, yeah, so that yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the skin gets used yeah, to. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps with this, I don't think he needed to do that because it it's a very light touch anyway with the candle wax. It's not a harsh yeah. thing. It's a very heightened sensation. Is probably good because already it's a hot, it's a drip of a candle wax. So you don't want it to be like hugely sense, you know, hugely warmed up because you won't then feel it. I okay, think. yeah, yeah, yeah. That I see what sense, you mean. Yeah, that makes sense. And you said you were actually standing up. That I find interesting because um, it would have been more difficult. I, I mean, like if somebody's lying down, mm. you could drop the this thing, yeah. but I guess this makes for the drip. It makes <laughs> the dripping. Yeah, more. yeah, yeah, it does. Well. You know, like I said, I, I'm um, I'm so delighted that you're over here talking to me about this, talking with me about this, because I really think that it's that before and after that's so important for people to understand. And you cannot go in and say to somebody, I want to try this out. It's about can we try it out? Should we try it out? And the really important thing is where you begin. Do you begin with spending an entire evening just hugging each other, talking about how you're going to try it out? Let that be an evening of foreplay for the next thing. It is so important for people to understand this. And we just, you know, we, we use the word, like I said, we literally bandy the word consent. What does consent even mean? Do you think that there's a specific description that you would give to the word consent if you were in, in terms of trying to explain to people. I think, is this some, what, what, is, what does the word consent mean? Does somebody consent to the thing you're doing? Do they accept it? Do they like it? Do they respond to it positively? And I think... Yeah. If we think about the word, what is the word and what does it mean? And you're absolutely right. Consent is bandied about here and left, right and center. But I don't think we're thinking about it enough. And if you're, there can never be too much consent. Let, let's just say it this way. You can never say it too many times. So you make sure you're doing it verbally. You're asking your lover, I am going to do X or I'm thinking, oh, I would like to do X. What do you think? Would you like this? And you can be very clear. The other person can say yes or no, or maybe. And they're very clear cues. And they are your cues. And also when you're engaging in whatever physical act you're engaging in, 
ask, wait, give it a second or two to judge how they're responding. And you can tell we're human beings, we're wired to pick up signals from each other. You can see on their face, you can see on their body. They love it, they hate it, they're not sure about it. And then you, you kind of decide what your next step is going to be, right? So consent is about, does somebody consent to something? Do they find it a positive experience? Do they like it? And that's simple. It is, isn't it? It's just that simple that if you want to do something to somebody that you ask them, and if they say, um, you try it out a little bit, if they've said yes, you start with something small. And if they like it, you can go a little bit more. And if they don't like it, you need to stop and move on. Isn't that what we mean each time that we say, there's a set of rules that this is where you learn, you understand to, um, the, the idea of rules. Tell me, the couple that you spoke to, did they talk about how you come to make the rules? I mean, like, what did they say about, because mine was, like I said, short-term experience, one-on-one yeah, yeah, yeah. -on -one with, you yeah. know, in a workshop. Yeah, so yeah. it's very easy to make up yeah, rules yeah, at that yeah, point and yeah. say, I don't want that. Please don't do this. Don't come, you know, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. How do you come to rules within a relationship? So I, with with the two of them, I don't really remember. I'm sure they've, because it's a long-term relationship, I'm sure they've discussed it and come to whatever agreements they came to. But within their kind of play uh, situations, if they went somewhere else where they were playing, uh, I remember her very clearly telling me that at each step you would ask, every single step you would ask, can, you know, can I come into this room? Is it okay if I talk to you? Can I touch you? Can I kiss you? Can I do such and such to you? And it is as explicit. And she's like, it is boring as hell, but that is part of what they do. Nothing is done unless there is explicit and express consent given for that act, whatever that act might be. So it is that commonplace. Nobody does anything unless the other person says, yes, I would like this. Or no, I wouldn't like that. And that's how the, the rules were in their kind of space. And I think that that should be a fairly easy one to understand. Ask at every point. Wait Ask for a yes or no. Point. Exactly. There are no fluid moments where you say, no. oh, but the passion is high and I really want. And I could see mm. from her face that she really or he really wanted. It doesn't work like that. You doesn't. can't see from their face. Ask. It's Ask. as simple as that. It is literally as simple as that. A yes, no cannot be confused <laughs> <laughs> yeah and should not don't go bollywood on this yeah it's don't not go bollywood a bollywood this. film this is real life <laughs> if he or she is saying no it means no no <laughs> and um, just to wind up the conversation um the idea of the safe word now we yeah. hear a lot about the safe yeah. word yeah uh again from what i understand it's you know, I think in my session with my then partner, I, I can't remember what the safe word was, but we did have one. We did have one. And he said to me, you need to say X every time you feel uncomfortable or whatever. And I think from my very limited understanding of this, I am not an expert, that you always, always agree a safe word, because that is the one thing that say you might say, oh, I like the sound of this. And then but Two minutes in, you're like, okay, I, I can't really bear this. Like you were saying with, when your hands were tied or for me as well, when I was blindfolded, initially I thought, oh, interesting. And then as I went into it, like, okay, my body's saying no, it's a very clear no. So then how do you stop it? I think a safe word, whatever yours might be. And I think it's very individual. It could be, I don't know, purple. It could be anything, right? <laughs> <laughs> because you've got purple on top of me is the first thing I thought of. Uh, but something that you both know, something that you both understand to be the safe word. I think that's the key. It doesn't matter what the safe word is, as long as you both agree that that is it. And the minute someone says that, the other person stops whatever they're doing. And I think that's, again, very, very important because in our own minds, we might be willing to go to sort of what feels like a dangerous place because it's exciting, but we also want the safety to know that it could stop, like the knot you were talking about, Seema, when you're a beginner, the knot that you can undo as a beginner is very, very important to our kind of psychological sense of safety, right? And that's the safe word, I think. It's the same Yeah, it's literally, it's, it's such an important thing to your psychological brain, um, you know, to know that 
okay, I've been tied together, but I can actually bring my own hands out of this knot because that really bothered me. Yeah. It really bothered me. Yeah. And so I guess what we are both trying to say to everybody out there that BDSM is a word that gets bandied around. We talk about it a lot. Everybody thinks that they want to try it. It's the new thing on the porn hub. It's like, yeah, yeah we're going to do this. Um, and then people understand the word uh, consent and rules has got thrown into the mix. But what does it actually mean? And as you heard from Sangeeta, that every single time, it, it, putting rules into place is not a difficult thing. The first rule should be, do you want to do this? I'm going to do this. Is it okay? Yes or no? If you cannot understand how to make other rules, keep it to just simply that. Yes or no? It's the simplest thing you can do. Yes? Should that be rule number one, Sangeeta? Yeah, I, I think, think that should be rule number one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> rule number two is go extremely slow. You don't go charging in like a bull in a china shop, especially if you are the one who wants it and your partner doesn't. It's got to be extremely slow. That whole sort of incubation period needs to be over there. Did you have an incubation period? Uh, because mine was such a limited experience. I, I'm not sure. I'm no, with your most... partner, did you find yeah. that like there were time did you talk for any length yeah of time? we did and in fact before we began our session we had a whole discussion about it and he said to me i would really like to do this what do you think and i was like oh that sounds really interesting explain to me how it works so he explained to me i thought about it and then i said yes yeah. so there was definitely an incubation period before we you know before we did whatever we did in, in, a, in our bedroom absolutely so i think that's a really important point there seema Brilliant. So you have your, you go slow, you have your incubation period where you actually spend a couple of days just discussing what it will feel like. Talk about it. Talk. Talk about it, really. And for me, I think the thing that really put my, my heart beat to rest, you know, that really sort of calmed me down was the amount of time that was spent with, with this other girl who was a stranger with her arm around me saying, and, you know, she had to put her arm around me and then just stroke me and say, it's going to be okay. It'll be fine. You'll be fine. It's not anything you won't like. And I was so nervous. I was still so nervous because I do not like pain. I have no pain threshold and the idea of being spanked. And some of the other couples had already started by then. So you could hear that, ah, oh, you know, and, and like, oh my God, I really don't want this. Yeah, I really don't yeah, want this. Yeah. So it is extremely nerve wracking. I had gone in voluntarily to attend this workshop. Um, for the sake of my work so that I could understand when I explained it or when I wrote about it, it was very hard. So imagine somebody who doesn't have the option of an out. Um, you don't want to traumatize them and scar them for life because that's violence. Yeah, that is violence, absolutely. So um, yeah, I just hope that this session has been useful for you. I really hope that you're going to take away some of the advice from this. And like, like we said, even if it's just about whether how slow you're going to go, what rules you're going to have, the yes and no, and just understanding that it's all about being so uber gentle that it makes the other person feel that a little bit of pain is fine and feel cared for and feel loved yeah. and not threatened because being threatened is not sexy. Not at all. It's the opposite it's of sexy. It's the opposite of sexy. If you've enjoyed the session, as always, please do like, comment, subscribe. Um, if you need to get in touch with me, I am on info.seema.anand at gmail.com. You can send your questions in over there. And if you'd like to get in touch with the beautiful Sangeeta Pillai, she is on Instagram, um, on under Soul Sutras, on Twitter, also Soul Sutras, uh, Sangeeta? That's correct, yes. And of course, you have an email address, which is email at soulsutras.co.uk. Don't worry if you haven't managed to get any of that information. It'll all be in the description. So you'll have access to her anyway. Uh, but yes, Sangeeta is over there to answer any questions as well. In the meantime, stay safe, look after yourselves, and we will see you over here next week again. Thank you so much. Bye.